Hi guys, I'm Joyce Kim. I'm here to talk to you about Korean pop, which is really important for big data. Um, we're going to start off with a quick pop, a quick pop quiz. Three Korean guys. How many of you guys can recognize these people? To the left, we have Kim Jong Un, the supreme leader of North Korea. In the middle, we they're going awfully fast. We had a uh, Sai, uh, who's obviously a Korean pop star, and that was my brother I threw in there. So Korean pop has uh, Korea has impacted pop culture on the web for a very, very long time now. But this past year was actually the first year it started to impact the music industry. Uh, so I'm here to give you a crash course on Korean pop. K-pop got its start in 1992 when a group called Sotejin Boys debuted on the Korean equivalent to American Idol. It was unlike uh, anything Korea had ever seen. It had rap and electronic music and b-boy moves and the judges absolutely hated them. They came in dead last, they were booed off the show. The very next day their sales went through the roof and they became the longest running number one hit in Korea. This led to a slew of girl bands and boy bands. Uh, this is what they look like. They were hugely successful and they probably look a little silly to you guys here in the room, but I want you to remember what was going on here in the US at the same time. It actually wasn't that different. We had New Kids on the Block, which came into the Backstreet Boys era. Uh, it's all about pop music. Pop music is about manufactured groups and their visual impact. So when did visual impact become important to music? It started with TV, and the earliest examples of really great music on TV was Motown. And I would argue that Korean pop took the Motown model and added a modern Korean twist. They, took, they found the best people, trained them up, and this time we're using the internet instead of television for distribution. So let's talk about Korean pop stars. They are ridiculously good looking. Uh, and it doesn't happen by accident. It's not like a group of really hot people come together and say, we're gonna make music. They're assembled and they are scouted across the world uh, through a series of global auditions to find people with a particular look who can sing and dance. The reason they use these global auditions is because Korean music has always had an eye for global growth. So they really recruit talent that speaks multiple foreign languages. So these are two really famous singers in Korea. The girl is Chinese American from LA. The guy was uh, Thai from uh, LA. They are put through two to seven years of really heavy training. This is a before and after pick. They're trained in singing, dancing, more foreign language skills from 6 a.m. to about midnight, seven to six days a week. So what did they do with these people after they got them all together? How did K-pop really kind of move out of the confines of Korea? It comes down to one really important fact. Korea's really, really wired. We have the fastest internet in the world and everybody is constantly online. So this culture of connectedness has uh, really allowed Korean music executives to become online marketing experts from StarCraft to Psy. So how did they use the internet? They started off with Twitter. Twitter has been hugely popular in Korea long before it became mainstream here in the United States. Um, why? Because Twitter is really good for photos and a picture's worth a thousand words. So this cat is more famous than anybody in the building. And the reason that is, is that this cat is owned by a Korean pop star named Hee Chul. And this cat spent most of 2011 hanging out with Justin Bieber on the Twitter trending list globally, uh, because every time Hee Chul would tweet a photo of his cat, the internet would just explode, and we know that's because the cats power the internet. So, this is how Twitter was used. YouTube was actually much more important to Korean pop, and this is because it's little known fact that people outside of Korea, they don't actually speak Korean, so nobody knows what they're listening to. So the Korean music industry really kind of looked at itself and said, how do we use YouTube, and how can we really get our music out there? One of the first things that they did is they started to change their songs to add English lyrics to all the Korean pop songs. These catchy lyrics that you can kind of sing along to and follow along with. Then they would put subtitle versions on YouTube so that non-Korean fans could feel part of it and sing along. Uh, the other thing they did is they invested really heavily into Korean pop videos. Epic storylines, really colorful characters, and amazing kind of fun choreography. All things that we've seen with uh, Gangnam Style. And they made him addictive to watch. You just want to watch him over and over and over again. So we'll talk a little bit about Psy. Psy is obviously the undisputed king of Korean pop. Some people say that he's not a really good representative because he's not ridiculously good looking and he was never a trainee. But to me, Psy is actually a complete product of the Korean music industry. And this is why, because in Korea, Psy is represented by YG Entertainment, one of the top record labels in Korea. YG was founded by the same singer whose own debut was kind of ridiculed by judges in 1992. And this guy really prefers to sign singer-songwriters who can bring their own unique uh, kind of vibe to, this, to the music. So if we look at Gangnam Style, it's got all the elements of K-pop. It's got catchy English lyrics, it's got a colorful visual story, and it's got great choreography, but it still allows Psy to be uniquely himself throughout the entire video. So hopefully in the past few minutes I've piqued your curiosity a little bit about Korean pop. If you want to see more, I put together a video playlist which you can find on that bit.ly link. Uh, thank you.